Rip City Mornings. Joining us now to talk about all that and a whole lot more, friend of the program, lead NBA writer from NBC Sports, Kurt Heelan back on the big show. Good morning, Kurt. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. By the way, I love, you're not the only person to do this. I love the way former six man of the year Tyler Hero is basically now a copy or, or a chair to like most of NBA Twitter. Like, <laughs> like the guy can legitimately play. He's not necessarily a good fit for Portland. The guy's good. Like I don't know how I don't know how we got to deciding he's like some horrific player. Well, and that was going to be uh, one of the things I want to bring up. So let's just bring it up now. Like, uh, what I understand the Blazer part of it, right? We got a lot of guards yeah. out here in in Portland. Yeah. We are we are swimming. In uh, you know, in six one six two guards, so I, I get why it doesn't fit to be a part of a, a trade package. But then you keep hearing about, well, we'll just put him in a three team deal. But nobody wants Tyler Hero anymore. When the heck did that happen? Yeah, it's a little surprising. I also think he is a fit. Look, he was. That's a big contract, four years, one twenty. He, yeah. He's, he's going to make a lot of money. Um, that's one of those contracts, though, where you kind of balk at the number, but over the cap as it keeps rising the next few years, it's not that bad on the back end. Like it's not a bad contract on the back end. He, he look, he has a very specific skill set. He can go get you buckets. He's got good handles. He doesn't defend well. And I think that we kind of got cut up in this. Look what they did without him in the playoffs with, with, with Gabe Vincent kind of running the show and Tyler Hero's just a better player overall than Gabe Vincent, but I can tell you, I, I've talked to people there, people in Miami considered making that move midseason, and it's just that Tyler Hero's a better fit for them off the bench, because they wanted the ball in Jimmy Butler's hands, they had shot creation, Gabe Vincent provides a little of it, Max Drews provided a little of it, and they were kind of like, we need, we need him off the bench where he can just go nuts, and we don't have to worry about hiding his defense as much, so I, I think he's absolutely got a role, and if you put him in Utah or Brooklyn or somewhere, he's going to put up really nice numbers. He's just he, – he wasn't necessarily the perfect fit in Miami and certainly isn't somebody you need in Portland. Well, we're in a unique situation here, uh, Kurt, because obviously uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago Damian Lillard came out and said, yeah, I'd like to be traded only to Miami. Miami is the only option, and go ahead and make that deal. And shockingly, it, it hasn't been made yet. And – a lot has been talked about out here about leverage, and it's it's interesting, Kurt, because a lot of times, usually one entity has the majority of the leverage. I don't know who does in this situation. On on one hand, you've got the Miami Heat, who are just like, we were in the finals without Damian Lillard last year. We can kind of slow play this. But then also, on the other hand, you've got the Blazers, who definitely want to get this deal done by training camp, but they've already yeah. got their point guard of the future on the roster, and... And needing a piece back to compete, it's, who has the leverage in this whole deal? Or is it a simple answer that nobody does? I was about to say, I'm not sure either side has all that much leverage. Yeah. Because Lillard, at the end of the day, still has four years on his contract. Uh, and nobody I spoke to, it's funny, this came up, every time Lillard came up when I talked to somebody in Las Vegas, it was some variation of what you said before. Yeah, that's not going to get done until closer to training camp. Like that, that's a Donovan Mitchell September type of trade. Not it's not happening soon, but it was part of actually that too, which is Lillard doesn't have leverage, but right now neither do the Blazers, only because nobody else is really stepping forward. And I don't think that's just a function of of Aaron Goodwin, the Lillard's agent, going out and trying to scare people off. I don't think that really affects teams as much as people think it does. It's that Lillard is. A, 30, or turning 33, just turned 33, wherever the word would I know his birthday's coming up. Um, he's going to make $60 million on the back end of this contract. And as elite as he is now, like, you've got to send him someplace like Miami where it's an absolutely win now. He's not really on the timeline for other teams. There just isn't this bidding war for him right now. So the, there's just not leverage of... I mean, there's all these great theoretical trades of, hey, you can do this with, with the picks in Utah or Brooklyn or OKC or wherever. Those teams aren't making those offers. So until they do, or they're not, or they're making low ball ones. So until there's legitimate offers on the table, nobody does. And this is the NBA. Until there's actual pressure to make a deal, nobody will, which like you said, we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get closer to training camp and then the needle will start to move again. 
Kurt Heelan, lead NBA writer for NBC Sports, joining us here on 620 Rip City Radio. Uh, looking past Miami, if in fact it, it does get to uh, uh, that particular point, how interesting does Philadelphia get? Because uh, I know you just yeah. wrote on, uh, on on the NBC Sports dot uh, com website, and and we saw well, a lot of us saw that clip of Joel Embiid saying, "I just won a championship," whether it's in Philly or somewhere else, and all of a sudden yeah. uh, Philadelphia might all of a sudden get a little antsy because they're trying to find a trade partner with James Harden. Um, where where do you think Philadelphia is maybe in kind of freak out mode that maybe potentially Joel Embiid might not be all that happy? They're definitely a little more at freak out mode only for that reason. It, you know, I've said from the start, and I'm not the only person to say this, that, that the most important person in the James Harden trade is Joel Embiid. Like he turns 30 um, next March they don't have time to wait. Like this is his, he is the reigning MVP. He is one of the five best players in the league. You have to win with him now. And they can't like gap play this for, you know, let's, let's trade Harden for picks. Then we'll flip those into, no, you, you got to get stuff back. And so, yeah, they're definitely in. I know that Lillard, Lillard to Philadelphia conversation, you know, three-way trade is, is out there. I've been told that that didn't get any real, any real traction in discussions, and I'm not sure if it would or wouldn't. Again, when we get closer, when there's real pressure, but that's another one where there's not a lot of teams. Jump. James Harden is not on the upswing of his career. There's not a lot of teams jumping in to get there right now, and it's it's just. I still think he's going to end up back in Philadelphia to start the season because there's just not another option for like no neither side has another option that's any good and and the clippers are going to sit there with the you know the team that he allegedly wants to go to apparently wants to go to and say why are we giving up anything <laughs> where where's the pressure on us we're you know like we we're, we're so we're so all in for next year let's hope everybody can stay healthy that either we get lowered or we or we i mean we get a uh, partner we don't and it's still the same it's, they're, they're, it still comes back to how Kawhi's Leonard knees are on any given day Kurt one last thing on the uh, on the Dame part of this and then I actually do want to talk about actual basketball players that'll be playing for the Blazers uh next season which I'm very excited about but what, the thing on Dame we saw the reports going around that uh, uh Aaron Goodwood his his agent was was telling teams look if you're not named Miami Heat, don't make a trade. He is he, he will not be happy. And there were some people that even said, well, he might not even report if it's not Miami, which is interesting because that has never quite been in the characteristics of Damian Lillard his entire time in Portland. Obviously, things can change, but it seemed very surprising that that was the tactic of Dame's agent, a guy who has always been a, a, a solid citizen, both on the court yeah. and off the court, to go, with the route of, yeah, if you're not Miami, you might be trading for a guy that just might not show up, which I don't really see as, as the case. Were you surprised that, that they went with such a hard line, or is that kind of par for the course with these uh, trade demands? Yeah, I just say, I think it's just more how the game is played. Yeah, And the front office people I spoke to with out in Las Vegas were also, again, back to, yeah, even if it comes, even if it comes from somebody we know can be disruptive, we're not that worried about it usually. Unless the guy's in the last year of his contract or if it's Jimmy Butler, you might want to worry about it. Jimmy Butler has a long year, right? Like James Harden has forced his way out of places you might be more concerned. But generally, they're not that worried about that comment. It's just part of how the game is played. And like you said, in Lillard's case, nobody can really picture him like not showing up or or like going Jimmy Butler in a Miami in a Minnesota practice, yeah. like just he's just not that guy. So um, nobody's terribly worried about that. So yeah, I, I think it's I think that that made a nice story for a while, but I don't think that one moved the needle at all with the actual people doing the negotiations. Kurt Heelan is the lead NBA writer uh, and uh, for NBC Sports, uh, talking NBA, obviously. The Dame thing is going to take a while now, and uh, while we're on pins and needles out here, we realize that's just not quite how the, uh, the the timetable works. But let's talk about a guy who will be on the, the court for the Blazers. Uh, Kurt, uh, you, you were there in Vegas. We got about 23 minutes of Scoot Henderson, and, I mean, right, we just get the Hall of Fame ready? 
Is it just yeah, exactly. we're done deal? All right, moving forward, like Dame to Miami, great because we saw twenty three minutes of Scoot Henderson, and uh, yeah, let's the the Scoot train is is running out of bandwagon, and he hadn't played a full NBA minute yet, Kurt. No, I was high on him before the draft. Uh, you know, I've seen him playing in the G League. I'd seen him in person a couple times. Um, I'd interviewed him. Um, I think. I think what you're looking for most and the, the hardest thing to predict with any you know, 19, 20 year old, especially coming into the draft is like, just what's going to happen when they get money and a little bit of fame and the temptation, like what kind of person are they? And that's, and that's the hardest thing to predict with, you know, I don't care if I talk about the baseball draft or the NFL draft or whatever, like the mental makeup stuff is, is the hard question he seems to have his head screwed on right. And that's the thing that most impressed me. It's not just the way he played physically that he's already basically an NFL running back, just, just getting downhill. Uh, he plays with his head up, makes the right plays, great decision-making in those, you know, in that game out there. It, you could tell he'd spent two years playing with men, not, a, not, not like some AAU circuits and some college basketball. Like he, knew how to run a team and direct guys. It was fantastic, and I'm, I'm excited. I, look, I think he's going to be very, very good at the least. I think his floor is really high, and he's a cornerstone-type player. And that I, absolutely – those 23 minutes were really impressive in what, by the way, might have been the most entertaining summer league game I've ever seen. Like, that game was so much fun with so many athletes. Like, that was, like – First night of summer league, not even the hype game that night, and it was the best game of summer league. Also, like you mentioned, having his head on straight. While he would never be in the situation, I can guarantee you, Scoot Henderson would have apologized to Brittany by now. I'm just saying, we would we would have gotten an apology for Brittany. <laughs> the funny thing is, <laughs> like, and outside the weirdness of that whole situation, was like somebody put to me like. Brittany's been a celebrity for how long? Like, you know, if a guy's got security, you don't run up behind him, right? Like, <laughs> you think she'd know better having her own security force after this long. But, but there you go. I don't even, did he even notice it was the best part of that? He <laughs> watched the video. Like, I'm not even sure Wemby knew what happened. No, I don't think he had any clue what happened. But I will say, should have apologized by now. I mean, plenty of opportunities. Yeah. Should have apologized by now. I realize he's a 19-year-old from France. Still probably should know uh, about Hit Me Baby one more time. It was a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, but let's speak of worldwide phenomenon. Let's talk about Wemben Yama because he came in, uh, looked very tired, which shouldn't be too yeah. surprising considering the, like you mentioned, the whirlwind tour that he has been on. And he's also coming off of a full season of basketball and it is also summer league. Uh, but there's already talk now that the Spurs, I mean, the Spurs, Kurt kind of invented load management towards the, the yeah. latter years of, of some of their superstars. And now they're talking about potentially load managing a 19, soon to be 20 year old rookie. What's going on with Wembenyama and the Spurs? Are they really going to load manage him this year? Uh, they're going to slow play this a little bit. I yeah. don't know that they're like not going to play him on back to backs, but it was it's the most Spurs thing ever. It's why I told people, yeah, I, I was on some shows. I'm like, man, if I were a betting person, I'd be looking at Scoot and maybe Chet Holmgren or something as rookie of the year, um, just because not because I don't think Wembyama is going to be. I don't. I was about to say everything he's been hyped up to be. That may be too extreme for any human being, but like, not that he's not going to end up being an elite player, but that's just not how the Spurs bring guys along. Like that's just, they're not going to put too much on his plate. They are not going to go out and trade for Dame this year to try and win right now. That's just not who they are. So I genuinely think he'll play. I don't think they're going to still play it that much, but he plays 65 games and they really focus on conditioning and keeping him healthy and they win 35 and they're okay with that this year. Like it'll they're not looking to win it all this season. Like it's going to come, maybe it comes, maybe it all comes at that, them faster than that because he's just better than even I think he's going to be. But I think, I know I think what we, what we saw in Vegas is what we're going to get out of him this rookie year, which is up and down offense depending on the night. But Jesus, he's a defensive force, and, and I, and I, I can't. I, I've said this before. I don't like. I'm used to being. A, I cover the NBA for a living. Like I don't blink at being around guys who are six, nine anymore. And he walks in a room and there's still a moment 
with everybody. The first time he walks past you, we're like, holy <laughs> mother, that guy is so big. Like, you, you really can't put into words how big and long he is. All right, Kurt, uh, you were down in Vegas. Uh, I was down there a, a week ago as well. Went to RPM Italian in Caesars. Uh, give that a thumbs Ooh. up if you haven't been to RPM. I also went to the one. I've been to the one in Chicago. Uh, held up. Went to Gordon Ramsay's pub. Not so great. Um, eh, yeah, I've been to that one. It's yeah, okay. it, not so great. I feel like a lot of people who watched uh, Hell's Kitchen probably go there. Um, where, where, where'd we eat in Vegas? What do we got? Oh, um... I, I, one of my fallbacks, just like my treat myself fallback, is Scarpetta, uh, Scott Conant's. I, I know it's a it's a New York place, but it's in it's in Cosmo. But uh, oh. his actually his Italian his, his Ital it's Italian. His uh, just simple pasta sauce is best. I had maybe one of the best cioppinos I've ever had there. Um, this year I was I I'll tell you my other go to now just for a quick meal, like just running over to the arena. Um, Inside Resort World, and it's really the only reason I can think of to go to Resort World. <laughs> Inside Resort World, there's a like Street Foods of the World food court where they brought in like those street stalls in Singapore that have Michelin stars and places from India. Like, oh they yeah, have, they open second locations inside this street, and you just kind of order a kiosk and get food and like. I had maybe the best bow I've ever had and some stuff. There's just different places within there that's kind of – it's become my kind of fallback. It's not really like – it's a great lunch. It's not like a fancy, nice dinner place, but you can get a really good meal and get a kind of funky little eclectic mix of a few different things, so it's kind of fun. All right. Uh, on, on one hand, here in Portland, we are we are dealing with the Blazers post Damian Lillard, even though it doesn't feel like it because he's still on IG Live, and the Blazers still did wish him a happy birthday on Twitter, which was an, an interesting uh, little day for their social media team uh, over the weekend. But there is going to be uh, a, a new superstar emerging in Scoot Henderson, much like on our show, Kurt, because yeah. we now know that with Padma out, Kristen Kish now taking over. I like it. I like the move. I'm yeah. excited about it. She was one of my favorite contestants. Seems to have a good personality. I'm all for it. Where are you? I was. I was the same way. And I, when she was a contestant, I was. I didn't dislike her. I did. She was not one of my like. I just wasn't a fan favorite of mine. But she's kind of grown on me more as a, as she's kind of let more of her personality show over time. And she does. Have you seen the? I'm going to go blank on the name. Fast the Foodies Point Network. Fast Foodies. Yeah. yeah thank you. Oh, I love fast foodies, and she's just brilliant on that. And like, so yeah. Plus, she's done some other stuff since then. And I'm just kind of like, I was with you when she said when they said that. I'm like, wow, that's just kind of a natural fit where she's just going to be, she's going to be kind of perfect in the role because she knows her food. But she's become good at that hosting skill. That's as you know, weirdly kind of different than certainly different than cooking and and just being a personality. Like the ability to host things and do it smoothly is a you know, like as you do every day, it's just it's a skill, man. Well, some may be laughing at you saying that uh, that it is a skill for me because they listen to the show each and every morning. But uh, either, oh, <laughs> I, I did want to ask you: you are you do you watch the Bear? Have you watched the Bear? I love the Bear, oh. and I'm only part way through the second season right now, just because. Um, well, I've been a tad busy. Yeah, um, just a smidge. <laughs> life finally slowed down for me, and I. Uh, wife and I have tried to fit in little trips and vacations. So like I have not gotten through it all the way, but it is, it is, I look, I have a Chicago original beef of Chicago land knockoff t-shirt. <laughs> like I've got, <laughs> I love that show. All right. That answers my, I'm, I'm with you halfway through the second season. I was just, it's, it's becoming, it's becoming tough to watch though. Cause at some point, like I don't need a, uh, a Brady bunch ending Kurt, but at, at some point we got to get a win here. Right. <laughs> it's yes, it is. It is this. I will say that though, like my my experience. Did you? I just, I don't know if you worked in restaurants. I worked for a while in restaurants through college and stuff. I think there, it is the best sense of a vibe of a restaurant and how people talk to each other and kind of treat like the the actual vibe of the restaurant, not just the characters, but like the way the interactions happen. I thought was spot on. And I asked one day. I told a buddy of mine. I'm still friends with from that back in the day. Worked in restaurants. Like, if you watch this, because I got through one episode and it was PTSD. I couldn't get out. <laughs> I couldn't do it. 
Uh, I have not worked in in the uh, the food service industry. I I enjoy restaurants a lot, but uh, you are getting a lot of big nods from producer Brendan uh, in in the producers room, who has worked in plenty of of food service. So he's he's with you on that one. Hey, Kurt, always a pleasure. You can follow uh, Kurt Heelan on Twitter at Basketball Talk. You can read his stuff at NBCSports.com. Hey, have a uh, terrific week, uh, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Looking forward to it, man. Take care.